Dun, 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 dun. All right. We, we are live whenever we get people starting. And, and yes, we are recording. So. Okay. Yep. Um, if you just want to give me the high sign whenever we've okay. got folks all in and ready. We've got nine participants. I hope everybody is, uh, we're just kind of gearing up. We'll give people a few more minutes to come on in. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Catherine Merrick. I'm the current president of CSI Next. I want to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, we've got a great presentation from Holly Gottfriedson of American Metalcraft. She's going to tell us all about uh, rain screen and plate panels and all sorts of really cool stuff. And I think I'll just give it a few more minutes to let a few more folks trickle in. I see we've got 14, which uh, is a pretty good number. Let's, let's give it to, oh, three or four or five after. How's that, Holly? Are you good with that? That works for me. Yep. Actually, why don't you, um, you were going to tell a funny story to introduce yourself. If you want to maybe sure. go ahead and do that. Yep, I can do that. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Holly Gottfriedson. I'm the president and owner of American Metal Craft. Um, and yeah, so uh, we were just talking before the, the class started, and um, I mentioned that it's kind of an interesting path that I've taken to uh, metal manufacturing. I was actually in the art world. Um, I graduated with an art history degree and worked at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta for about three years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, met my husband, we got married, and American Metalcraft was his father's business. And slowly but surely, they would ask me to do different projects for them. Um, at that point in time, I had left the museum and I was in a more of a marketing and advertising role. And they would say, hey, can you help us with this website? Hey, can you do this flyer for us? And slowly, I worked over into a, a full-time position and I started learning the business from the ground up and really just fell in love with it. Um, and I love the artistry that's in metal manufacturing. We um, are able to create a lot of different custom pieces as well as rain screens. And uh, we also do sunshades, louvers, um, perforated ornamental metal. So you've got your whole litany of aluminum products. And um, I just love seeing the artistry and, and we do engineering as well. So, put, you know, putting all of our heads together and figuring out how can we build this? How can we create this, this vision and, and make it come to life? Um, so the artist in me really, really loves that side of, of the business. Cool. Well, it looks like we've got 15 people attending. So let's, let's get started. And uh, since we, and then anybody who joins in will just hopefully pick them up and keep on rolling. So okay. take it away, Holly. All right. So as I mentioned, um, I'm with American Metal Craft and uh, we started in 1986. My father-in-law started this company as a small fabrication shop. Uh, slowly we grew a national presence. Um, as I mentioned, our, our different product lines, um, you may have seen some of them, we're, we're coast to coast. Um, our largest project to date is the Fort Bliss Hospital in El Paso, Texas. We did 130,000 uh, square feet of rain screens, fascia and soffit panels, as well as column wraps. Uh, we did the LG he headquarters in Inglewood, New Jersey, um, the 14th Street Bridge in Atlanta, uh, the SeaTac Delta Sky Club in Washington. So we're we're all over the place. Um, so it's a lot of fun. We've um, we also have a paint line, and we started that business in 2004. Our sister company is Finishing Dynamics. Um, in 2010, we combined facilities, so now we can engineer, fabricate, and finish all under one roof. Uh, that saves our customers a lot of money between, you know, shipping between two facilities and we can control the process from start to finish. Um, I purchased American Metalcraft from my family, so I'm a second generation owner. Uh, we are now a WOSB certified company. I know owners a lot of times like that certification, especially for government uh, and school projects. So. Let's go ahead and get into, here are a few of our professional organizations. 
Um, we are proud members of Women in Manufacturing, the National Association of Women in Construction, AIA Atlanta, uh, CSI of course, Georgia Manufacturing Alliance, and then we are also in the Master Spec catalog. And we won an award last year, which we were pretty excited about. We got a Woman of Excellence Award from Metal Forming Magazine. So before we jump into panels, this is just a, a little bit of those other um, types of projects that I was talking about earlier. This is a crown piece we developed, and this started off as a napkin sketch. An architect came to us and, and had this idea, but wasn't sure how to, how to make it reality, and we helped him with that. Some sunshades on the right. Uh, this is perforated panels. This is water jet work on a bridge. And then down here, this is a uh, Chinle, Arizona and, and a trade school, a perf pattern with some dimpling in between. And so we'll get to our topic of discussion today, the wet seal panel and rain screen systems. Holly, I'm going to make a quick comment. Just, uh, sure. oh, hot, sorry, sorry I, I should have said this before. If you guys have questions, Please type them into the chat, and we're going to save and try to save them to the end. But if you if you want to go ahead and type them in, I will read them out, and Holly will grace us with what answers she's got, which I'm sure will be great. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go for it, Holly. No, 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 no problem at all. Um, so we'll just the things that we're hoping to achieve today is we'll understand the AMA testing standards and the air, water, and filtration requirements. We'll understand how to make a zero waste panel utilizing the material uh, measurements for that exact with zero drop. And we'll understand some of the coding options for metal and, and how to figure out what, what the best one will be for your, your project. Um, so current economic trends in metal. So COVID obviously has impacted everything in the planet. Um, construction, aluminum, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, we did see an increase uh, demand for aluminum for medical devices. Um, you know, thinking about the ventilators that were in high demand and a lot of the medical equipment required aluminum uh, to be manufactured. Um, you also will see that there's in May, or these are the last statistics I have, um, the backlog indicator was, you know, it had fallen a little bit compared to May of 2019, but given the circumstances, it wasn't as bad as, as it could have been. So, and it, there's a positive outlook in the industry from what I um, can see and also with conversations I've had with other people that are in the uh, construction field. Um, also, going back a little bit, we want to talk about metal tariffs. Um, Section 232 was actually implemented by President Kennedy. And in 2017, uh, President Trump started looking at amending that to take a look at metal and tariffs and the potential for bringing more domestic metal production back to the states. Um, we have really good suppliers with our, uh, or we have really good relationships with our, our metal suppliers. And so they let us know while this was kind of in the whispering stages that these, the, the tariffs might become a reality. And, and you know, like y'all, we, we usually plan projects two to five years out. We're quoting jobs maybe a year, two years in advance. So we wanted to be sure and give all of our customers a heads up, jobs that were in process, especially that three-year project I mentioned. Um, we got a hold of them and said, hey, go ahead and buy all the metal that you need now for this project because we, we think there might be a spike in prices. And we wound up saving a lot of folks money. Um, of course, the market did correct itself and now we've got a lot of domestic production online. Um, these are just a few of the, uh, companies that have now brought domestic production back. Um, as a matter of fact, Century Aluminum, they had their headquarters in Iceland and they had shuttered three plants in, in the States and they've now restarted those for aluminum production. And here are just some advantages of aluminum products. Um, aluminum is a highly recyclable and non-toxic uh, metal, it's resilient, it's weather resistant, stain resistant, 
It's non-combustible, non-sparking, non-magnetic. Um, the PVDF coating that we'll talk about in a little bit self-extinguishes. Um, you can weld, polish, and paint over corners. One of the advantages of having uh, fabricated products post-painted is that you can coat all of those edges. If you're looking at something that's maybe pre-coat coil, um, when that's sheared, when that's fabricated, you're gonna have exposed edges. So, so with post-fabricated painted products, you'll, you'll have more protection there. Um, it can be joined in many ways and you've got uniform quality. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here are some design considerations for your panels. These right here are the standard material widths. Um, we are constrained by these, these widths. So we can't, typically we can't get a sheet that's larger than 60 inches wide. There are some sheets that are 72 inch wide, but since the tears happened, that's a little bit harder to get. The lead times on that may be a little longer. So you just wanna consider that when you're thinking about um, your panel sizes and, and what, what your panel design is going to look like. Um, one of the things you can do to save your customer money, for example, you have to think about the panel unfolded. The panel face may be 30 inches, but you're going to need three inches on either side of that for flanges. So if you're thinking about a 30 inch face unfolded, it's gonna be 36 and now you have zero drop. You're utilizing that material to the highest and best use. What happens if let's say your panel's unfolded and you're at 49 and a half inches? Well, now we're gonna to have to buy a 60 inch wide sheet and you're gonna have a lot of drop. That's gonna be more expensive. Um, of course, that, that drop's gonna be recycled, but had we been right within that 48 inches, we could have used that, that smaller sheet. <clears throat> so this is just a little bit more about that, you know, just always include six inches for flanges. And when I say six inches, I mean three inches here, three inches here, here and here. And then these are just a couple of, examples of how many panels you would expect to get if you've designed a, a zero drop panel out of these different widths in material. And this is folded panel production. Um, this is one of our latest and greatest babies. We purchased this last year. Uh, this is a Schroeder panel folder, state of the art. It's got the latest and greatest technology. Um, it's super efficient. Rather than taking two to three guys to do this process, we've got it down to one, sometimes two, depending on what we're doing. Um, you can see our guys here getting ready to set, set the machine. And then over here, you can see that we made some corner panels utilizing Big Bertha, as we like to call it. <clears throat> So this is a little bit about the most common gauges for panels, column covers, and anything formed. Um, 040 is typically gonna be too thin for panels. You're gonna see that more in trim and flashing. More common uh, gauges for panels are gonna be 063, 080, 090. We see those quite a bit. Uh, then we get into the thicker gauges, 0 0.125, 0 0.190, and 25 you're gonna start getting into more of a sheared edge panel rather than formed, especially with the uh, quarter inch plate. That's definitely gonna be a sheared edge panel. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move through the class. Um, limiting factors of gauges definitely is gonna be the size of the panels. The larger the panels are, you've gotta really look at your wind calcs. You've gotta look at the thermal. You've gotta look at if you're gonna have stiffeners or not behind those panels. There's a lot to consider. Uh, your manufacturing engineer should be able to assist you when you're thinking about panel sizes, where your job's located, are you in a high wind area, what height is this panel gonna be at, et cetera. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about alloys today. Um, the 3000 series is what we use mainly for forming. We were very excited, as a matter of fact, one of those uh, new plants I showed you earlier, they had only been producing 5000 series aluminum, typically for automotive industries, and now they're going to start producing 3000. So we were, we were tickled about that. Um, 5000 series is a little bit harder. Uh, 5052 is good for shearing and punching. It's called the poor man's anodize because it doesn't come with a, with a quality certificate. It's less expensive than this 5005 AQ, which does, but you're taking a little bit of a chance. Your anodizing may look a little uneven. You may have some issues with um, uniformity with that anodizing process. Uh, 5005 is going to be much more expensive, but the quality will guarantee a little bit better finish through that anodizing. Um, oops. And then finally, the 6000 series is extrusions. You can cut things out of it. You cannot form it. Uh, sometimes you see the 6000 series in, in Cornwall. Okay, so designing panels and the attachment methods. There's a couple of different ways that you can attach a panel. You can use Z clips, embedded Zs. Um, you can also use uh, hat channels, and that's typically what we like. So with the subgirts, think about a horizontal hat channel, which is usually 16 gauge galvanized steel you're hanging your, your panels over that hat channel. It's almost like hanging a, a picture. And then those are gonna be fastened uh, to the subgirts. In the order, you're gonna see the stud wall, you're gonna see the ice and water shield, you'll see the subgirts, hat channel, and then the panel. With the embedded Zs, you're gonna see uh, the stud wall with the embedded Zs, the insulation, the ice and water shield, and then the panel. Now, if you're in, let's say you're in a, a hurricane area, you're in Miami, they may require you to use those embedded Zs over the hat channel. The hat channel is just what we prefer. It's an easier installation. The installation is a lot faster with that method. Um, locking a panel, something that we don't do, we don't lock the panel by fastening it on all four sides. Typically, we use a uh, slot fastening so that you have a little bit of room there for thermal expansion. You'll see with uh, the wet seal system, your fasteners are going to be covered by your sealant and the pressurized rain screen system, the fasteners are going to be hidden. So you, you won't even see them. All right, so this is uh, the wet seal plate panel systems. They're a little bit on the dinosaur side of things. Uh, the rain screens are more of the cool kids these days, um, but it's still a good system. This is kind of what we started using uh, a few decades ago, and it used to be the primary weather seal on the building. So before ice and water shields were even an option, um, wet seal plate systems had to be weather tight. Uh, they had to use baccarat and sealant systems around the panels. The panels had to have welded and polished corners. So think about the expense of that. You've got a lot of labor. Those panels go up on a building and then you have to hire a, an, a company to come in and seal all of those panels to make sure that they are weather tight. Um, and your panel system is only as good as your, your sealant and, and the person that is installing it. So if he had a fight with his wife or maybe he had too much sauce the night before, you just don't know what's gonna happen. Um, but you know, all in all, it was a good system. The caulk after 20, 30 years is something that I think normally building maintenance, you've got to look at again and, and make sure that it's still holding up to the elements. Um, this is our wet plate system 100. In this one, you can remove a panel without taking down the whole system. There are some interlocking teeth, so this is a fairly easy panel remover. If a truck backs into it, if it's at the street level, if it's got some sort of damage, you can remove it and then replace it with a, a new panel. 
And these are just some details here. Uh, this is the Hearst Tower in the Carolinas. I believe this is Truist just bought this building to be their new headquarters. And this is an example of a wet seal system we did as well as spandrel panels. Um, and a little bit of the artistic work that we enjoyed doing over here is kind of the 3D uh, mural, if you will, that we did for the big entryway on this building. This is another example of a wet seal system. This is the Presidium building in Atlanta. Uh, another artistic element here, we did the spire at the very top of this building. And that was quite an engineering feat. My father-in-law helped engineer and figure out a way to get that thing all the way up there. Bell South, which doesn't exist anymore. So you know this is an older, older job. Um, this was another wet seal system in Atlanta, down in Limburg. And then this is uh, some details of the barrier plate system 200. We don't really see this a lot. I think maybe we did one system like this, but this is just to, to give you another idea of a, a barrier plate system that's out there. Um, you cannot remove a single panel on this because the panels overlap. So, you know, you might just create um, uh, an overlay if you had some damage to that panel and then reseal it in. Another few details here. This is the National uh, Marine Corps Museum out in Quantico, Virginia. And this is about 80,000 square feet of wet seal panels out there as well as some stainless work on the interior. And now we're gonna get to the, the cool kids. So this is a more economical system. This has become a lot more popular in the last 10, 15 years. And something that's unique about it is that it's dry joint. Um, you know, anybody can say that they have a rain screen system, but in order for it to be a true rain screen system, you have to have the AMA testing to back it up. It's a pressure equalized system. So no more than 5% of moisture with 5% of air can get behind that system. It's not weather tight, it's weather resistant because the ice and water shield behind it is the primary barrier. The rain screen becomes the secondary barrier. So if it's designed correctly and it passes all the tests, you don't have to worry about water draining behind the system because the evaporation will take care of the little bit of water that may get behind it. Um, another couple of interesting things about rain screens is you have no exposed fasteners. You have no caulk to put around each and every panel so you're saving on labor. You don't have to have the welded corners and have those all closed off and polished because it's the secondary system as a weather barrier, not the first. So it's definitely a much more economical system than the previous one we looked at before the, the wet seal. Uh, it, a, a true rain screen system must pass AMA specs 501 and 508. We did have third party testing. We uh, use a company called Intertech here in Atlanta. And it's, it's a rigorous process. They really put your panels through the ringer uh, before you can get a pass. This is an example of something that we would take to the testing facility. This is a test book. This is our RS400 system. And behind the, the panels is some plexiglass. You can see the attachments and the fastenings. And they do different tests, including this gigantic, and let's just be honest, it's a big ass fan that they use to throw on that thing, a whole bunch of wind, whole bunch of rain, and then they measure the results. And it's, I mean, it's amazing to see. I, I've been asking them to send me some videos to include, because I think it would be a lot of fun to, to share those with y'all. Um, hopefully I'll get those at some point. But these are just a few of the ASTM requirements, and then you can see the AMA tests as well. There we go, yep. Yeah. And here's an example of, of fans that are similar to those that they use in testing. 
it's, it's quite a process. Um, when someone tells you that they have an AMA tested rain screen system, I hope after today you'll know that they went through lots and lots of uh, design and, and thinking through. We did our own testing before we sent it off to the lab. And um, when you get that pass, it's, it's a great feeling. You kind of feel like Rocky at the end of the movie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our patented system. This is the RS100. Uh, something that's unique about this system is you can install it horizontally, vertically. You can modify it. It's a tab slot system. So it's, it's very easy to install. Uh, all of our installers have said that this is the fastest system that they've, they've used, hands down. Um, I like the brick pattern and, and I like the verticals and the horizontals stacked together. It just draws your eye and, and really gives, gives you some interest there. And here's a little four-way examples of, all right. So here you can kind of see it in our shop. This is before paint. And then as this is coming out on the paint line over here, you can see the little tabs at the bottom and how we can set them in different patterns. This is a great thing too, uh, because we have a paint line in house, there's no minimum on color. So for example, we were able to work with an architect. They had chosen three different shades of red. Um, the, I think the spec required that they needed a, a five-year warranty. I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but on exotic colors, and y'all may have, have heard about this before, but sometimes on exotic colors, the paint manufacturers will not offer a warranty on them because of the minerals that they have to add to the paint to make that bright, vivid color. So when you're working with a fabricator and a finisher that do both, they can kind of steer you in the right direction. And we were able to find reds that were uh, that met that five-year warranty criteria that looked very close to the original colors. But I love this building, it's so cheery. And then here's an example of, we did three different greens on this building. These were school colors and so we we had to match those. I believe Sean Williams worked with us on that so we could get these tones exactly right. But using all these different colors, you know, maybe one off, you're using gradients. You can use 18, 20 different colors and it really becomes the jewelry of the building versus having a lot of super complicated panel shapes and trying to do a lot of cut work within. So it's, it's, a, it's a great option. Here we go. You can see here we've got some horizontal straight pattern with a vertical brick next to it. So it, it really gives you a lot of options. And just some more. This was a, a trade school stadium. A little bit different pattern here. We've got the wide and then we've got the shorter squares. high school. And so this is where we modified it to be an equipment screen. You can kind of see that we wound up using an H pattern to hide some air conditioning units behind. So rain screens aren't just for walls. Uh, they have a lot of versatility. And this is the 200. Something that makes this unique is that you can change the color of the spring reveal. This would be something that would work well in a, in a lobby. Uh, if you're working on a children's hospital, you want blue panels with a red spring reveal. That's an option that you can use. Hmm. And this is an example of the 200. Now this customer opted not to use the different color with the spring reveal, it's all just basic white, but it has a nice clean look, very clean lines. Uh, this was out in Kentucky. As a matter of fact, the, um, the architect and, and the specifier had talked about going with 060 and our engineer of record did calcs on it. And based on the wind loads there, he recommended 080. And it turned out to be good that we went with that heavier gauge material. And there's nothing fancy about this rain screen at all. It's your basic old run of the mill, 
No, it's not highfalutin. It's just, but it works and it's, it's beautiful. And this is what we wound up working, um, uh, using on the Fort Bliss hospital project. This guy, it was, um, all over the place at this hospital. This was a three-year project. You can see all the panels there really turned out nice. Lots of work, but, uh, great result in the end. And then this is a recent add to our presentation. Uh, we just got Miami-Dade testing. So remember me telling you about the AMA testing we went through for the RS100. Well, turn your amp up to 11 because that's pretty much what Miami-Dade <laughs> testing is. They're throwing projectiles at, at your panels. They are just beating it to death. And so this is a rigorous, rigorous test. And we did get Miami-Dade uh, approval for our heavy sheared edge plate panel system, which you'll see momentarily. And here it is. So with this system, we're going to use one of those thicker, thicker gauges, quarter inch, 0.190, because of a couple of reasons. This panel has got an assembled back. So when we stud weld that back to the, the panel, we don't want any read through or dimpling on the front. If you use a thinner gauge, you, you run the risk of that happening. Uh, this panel system is great for monumental projects. We use this on the LG headquarters. This would be great for airports, museums, uh, government buildings, hotels. It's just, you have a clean line edge panel instead of the, the folded edge. So it's very crisp. And here it is on LG headquarters. You can see the, the joints have a, a little bit of a different look to them. And it's now Miami data approved. So we're excited about that. And this is it in process. You can kind of see where we've said well to these attachments here it's getting ready for the assembled back. It, it has to be painted first. The assemblies are painted and then it's shipped off to the job site. So we touched on this a little bit. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more into depth about this. Uh, when you're thinking about your paint, your coating for your aluminum pro products, especially panels that we're talking about today, but really in any aluminum product, you wanna think about the location of the project. If it is on the coast, you are most likely not gonna go with a two coat. You're gonna need a three coat or a four coat. You may need marine uh, grade primer underneath it. So it's always good to talk to your applicator about all of these considerations to make sure that you're choosing the right coating. The availability of warranty, which we touched on this a little bit, um, five, 10, and 20 year warranties are typically available for post fabricated painted products. It's going to depend, like I said, if it's an exotic color, what, what does the paint manufacturer offer? Because that's all that your applicator will be able to offer. Uh, Sherman Williams, Valspar, PPG, AXO have to look at what their parameters are. A standard or custom color. Sometimes there are paint manufacturers that will give you a five gallon minimum. So if you're thinking about three or four different colors and you want to get a sample, they're still most likely going to charge you a five gallon minimum. So you definitely want to talk to your applicator about which of those paint manufacturers have that requirement and which do not. Exo exotic colors we did talk about. Um, Pre-treat and primer. There were a lot of paint facilities that used chrome as their pretreat, and chrome, as I think everybody knows, is pretty bleh, for the environment and for people and you know the planet in general. Uh, so we switched to a zirconium primer, which is a lot more environmentally friendly. Um, the wastewater can be treated and returned back to the city with relative ease. So it's not the, it doesn't have the litany of issues that um, pre-treat chrome did in the past. And then lastly, we talked about the post fabrication advantage, making sure that all of those uh, edges are, are coated. 
Of course, that'll depend on your exposure drawings. Maybe it's something that you just want the front face painted, but you want to just coat those edges that are going to be exposed. Uh, perforated panels, we always paint both sides to make sure we get inside those holes and those perforations to be sure that we get all those edges coated. And then why PVDF? Well, PVDF is very, very strong. It has a very high performing shelf life, if you will, and Kynar, Hylar, and Solef are all brand names for it. And believe it or not, if you want some trivia to take home uh, later on today, fishing, specialized fishing line, is made from PVDF as well as batteries and some medical equipment uses PVDF as a coating because it's a uh, very high performing. And that's about it y'all. Um, I understand we probably have some questions here at the end so I'll be happy to answer those if I can. Great, I, I do have some questions. Uh, I did have one of our um, attendees wanted to know if you could repeat the requirements for a system to be considered a true rain screen. Sure, AMA testing. Um, it's five, AMA testing 508 and 501. Uh, it has to go through a battery of tests in order to be a truly pressure equalized system. Uh, there's third party testing laboratories throughout the US that do testing on manufactured products. And that's really important to have. So if you are considering a rain screen system and you're unsure if it's AMA tested, I would ask to see the testing data. Typically, if it's been tested, they can provide you with that on request. Great. Uh, I had a question about oil canning of panels. I know this is something a lot of us architects have run into with the cheap substitutes and stuff like that. And try what do we? How do we prevent oil canning of of panels? And what kind of minimum gauges, minimum thicknesses? What kind of advice do you have to eliminate the the really ugly oil canning? Well, you know. I think attachment method is really important in talking to your panel manufacturer about the span of your panel. You know, somebody may tell you, oh yeah, we can do a 60 wide sheared edge panel, but they don't tell you that you probably need uh, some, some backing behind that so that, you know, you it may be a little bit more of an expensive system because you've got uh, supports behind those panels to prevent oil canning and the cheaper guy that's in the game may say, oh yeah, we'll do it for you, no problem. And he puts it up and without those supports, now you're going to have that waving and, and that oil canning. Um, so mm -hmm. I think if you're in the design phase, it's always good to talk to your panel manufacturer. I think with plate panel versus an ACM panel, you're going to see less oil canning. You're going to see less of that if you choose the right gauge. Um, also, we do not recommend people attach panels to wood. That's another way some people try to save money is they don't want to do a subgirt system and a hat channel and all of that. And so you do wind up with pillowing and oil canning on those panels if uh, it's not attached correctly. Does American Metal Craft, um, you, you obviously have an on-site engineer. Do you offer engineering of the system as part of the design that you're, when, you, when you're working on a project or you, you're helping to engineer the system? You're not just providing a, a here's a panel, go figure it out. But yeah, we do the engineering for the panel system and we look at all aspects of that. We do have an engineer of record and uh, on our panel systems, on any of our engineered products. Yeah, that's always going to be uh, something that we'll provide. I have a question. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned Tunley, Arizona. What was the project and how is it holding up with the extreme climate swings, temperature swings? Oh, that's great. Um, so let me, I've got to stop screen sharing with you because I'll have to pull it up and find the name of it. We just completed it. It was a trade school and it's part of the Native American um, lands out there. And we just had it photographed. 
bear with me. I'll find that for you. Because if I don't probably, find it's it, probably, it's our it's our Tucson, Arizona compatriots down there who are oh, really okay. curious because they're yeah trying it's to figure the, out how to go see. Right, the Navajo Tech University. Nice. Um, and and yeah. how are you holding up to the climate swings? And have you? I imagine you've designed it to to take the temperature extreme. Yes, this was uh, it was perforated panels, and so it was a little bit different than the rain screen products we were discussing today. But we just finished it a few months ago, so so far so good. I don't anticipate any issues. Well. Just out of curiosity, were there any special design uh, inclusions for the temperature swings, uh, gaps or anything like that, expansion areas that you built into the detailing? I'm, I'm just curious. You may not, not have that information. That's kind of an unfair question. So. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. I would probably have to ask the PM that question because um, he was kind of down in the details, but I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Okay. Question for you, Holly. Where where is your plant and your manufacturing? You're you're obviously in Georgia. Are you outside? I mean, to those of us on the western part of the country, everything in Georgia is somewhere outside of Atlanta. So, <laughs> but where, where are you located? Yeah, and that's that's the God's honest truth. Yeah, everything kind of in Georgia revolves around the big city. Um, we're about an hour outside of Atlanta in a small town called Villarica. We have about a 75,000 square foot facility. Uh, so we have got a pretty nice size footprint there. And then we have a satellite sales office in Mississippi. Nice. So tell us like a lot of your projects have been on the East Coast. Do you have, how is your distribution for the rest of the country? I'm just, I'm just curious. Sure, so we've got- a lot of things in the South. Right, right. Um, we did the University of Idaho Research Center. Uh, we did BBCC Technical College, I believe, in Washington State. We're currently working on vertical sunshades for SFSU in California. Uh, we've got Philly Live coming up, which is a casino project where we're currently working on with perforated panels in nine different colors. Uh, Texas, I mentioned the Fort Bliss project. We are starting a job in Iowa, I believe. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're kind of all over the map. Hopefully we'll have some, some pictures of the Sunshade project in California to add to the portfolio here pretty soon. That would be great. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions, throw them up in the chat. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Now, um, you've got to have, you had mentioned some handouts to me that uh, some, some specs and stuff that we're going to be able to make available to our attendees uh, and put them on the CSI Next website. Why don't you tell us what, what all fabulous resources you have? Sure. Um, and part of them are already on our website. So you could go to AmericanMetalCraft.com. We have a tab called Details and Specs. If you click on that, you'll be able to see our rain screen RS100 details in a rendering. And you can, there's a couple of options on how you can download those. We will also have our spec, our installation instructions. And with our Miami Dade tested approved system, we're gonna be getting that online hopefully in the next 30 days. So what I'll be sending you will be uh, the performance spec for wet seal systems, just a general one for you to kind of review, just to kind of have it. Uh, you'll see our RS100 rain screen spec, and then I'll also send you a catalog of our panel systems. Kind of gives you a little bit of a, a taste of, uh, of some of our other products, but we have a full portfolio online. Feel free to check that out. You'll be able to see all the different products that we offer. And if you have any questions, need any additional information, I'd love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's a great place for us to just stay in touch with each other. Uh, my email is holly at americanmetalcraft.com. Feel free to email me. Any questions you may have, if I can't answer those, I have a wonderful team that uh, will help me answer those for you. That was my, that was my next question, is somebody had asked for your contact information. So we, we're also, we'll make sure that there's a link to your website 
um, on the past the past presentation information on the CSI Next website. Um, Question for question is the Butler Tech building off I ninety five I seventy five north of Cincinnati one of yours? I, it doesn't ring a bell to me. Um, I don't believe so. It, it, at least not in the last five years. It, is it an older project? Could be. I I'm I am not sure. So yeah, Blaine it, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, it doesn't ring a bell off the top of my head, but I may wake up at three o'clock in the morning and go, dang it, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> we can also send out a link to, yeah, Helene says it's red. It's probably older. Um, oh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the red one, you know that red one yeah, in Ohio. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. We will send out a link to all attendees. There, there should be a, there should be a, um, excuse me, post webinar uh, survey coming out. That if you haven't already registered with your AI number, it'll be coming out. Make sure you register. We'll also get everyone's email address to Holly so that she can send you contact information and she can send you some of this stuff. Um, I don't. I'm sort of running out of questions. I, if anybody else has any questions, um, <laughs> great presentation, Holly. Anything else you care to share with us? Uh, well, just a thank you very much for attending today. I, I really appreciate your time. And if you're ever down in Georgia and would like a tour of our facility, course in times of COVID that's a little challenging but mm. hopefully that'll be a short time we'd love to have you down we we without a pandemic we always had our facility open to architects and specifiers so that you could see the process and see our capabilities in person so I'll always offer nice. that to you excellent and um, I just want to offer you a really big thank you from CSI next we we all appreciate your giving us presentation and uh, we'll, we'll be in contact. So we'll get to the names and uh, thank you everybody for attending. Yes, you're going to ask me what the October webinar is going to be. We're still working on that one. It's going to be something cool. We're gonna talk about it in the board meeting that's going to follow this meeting immediately after. Um, I've got to talk to my board about it. So I apologize for not being organized <laughs> enough to to have that information for you but keep your eye on your email it'll be something cool it'll be coming soon and we hope to see you all very soon i hope everybody is staying safe and staying sane and and keeping your senses of humor in this weird time that we're in and i hope to see you all next month holly thank you very very much my so. pleasure thank you guys so much bye and, everybody uh, have a great labor day weekend y'all yes that's right labor day is coming up so, yes, ma'am. See, see you guys later. Thank you very much, Holly. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.